Testing. All right, good morning, brothers and sisters in the Dharma who are present here today in the BF West, and also to brothers and sisters who join our Sunday service online. Welcome to Buddhist Fellowship Sunday service today. A warm welcome to all of you. Before we start with the morning puja, allow me to announce uh, a couple of announcements first. The first is about the building fund project that Buddhist Fellowship is having right now. We would like to invite brothers and sisters in the Dharma to join our effort in doing the fundraising for the new home for Buddhist Fellowship so we can continue with the Dharma, pro with the Dharma propagations for all of our brothers and sisters in Singapore. So how to do that? That is, uh, you can either do transfer via pay now or write a check to Buddhist Fellowship uh, and indicate that this is for the building fund. Our Sunday service for this month has been laid out for every Sunday at 10.30, uh, except on the last week of the August where we have Ajahn Brahm and the service will start at 3 p.m. So next week, uh, this week we have Dr. Ng Yuan Yuan and next week we will have Sister Sylvia Bay to share the Dhamma talk with us. Yeah? So both are actually streamed live as well uh, at the comfort of your home. If you'd like to come to uh, Buddhist Fellowship, kindly register yourself first at our website. For BF Junior, we have the lower primary program next week on the 15th of August for the age of 7 to 9 for the lower primary. So if you are keen uh, or to register for your child, please uh, approach our office for that. The BF Junior Youth, for those aged 13 to 16, the service will also be available on next Saturday, 3 to 5 p.m., with the topic of being harmless and blameless. This session will be available online via Zoom. For BF Youth, the service will be on Saturday, on the 14th of August, then with the topic of what is right by Sister Fu Xiu Fong, and the session will also be uh, made online via Zoom. For Indonesian service, for this month, we are pleased to invite Brother Guido to share with us on the making peace in every moment. So this talk will also be hosted online via Zoom and YouTube, and it will be delivered in Bahasa Indonesia. So I think the ID is there with the passcode. Everyone is welcome to join online. The last one in on the, is on the Dharma Foundation course one with the topic of the fulfilling lay life has opened for registrations. So this program will start on the 4th of September for every Saturday until 18th of December 2021. The time is from 2 p.m. to 5 p.m. and the venue will be at the BF West Dharma Hall. So if you are keen to learn the basic foundations of the Dharma, please register for this program and we will have the speakers of Sister Sylvia Bay and Brother Ong Chai Chai. So registration is currently open uh, for on-site capacity, we limit it to the first come, first serve 50 people, whereas for Zoom, we can accommodate up to 100 people. So do register for your seat and your place before it runs out. There is a small maintenance fee of $50 for those who wish to join on-site and also $20 for those who wish to join online via Zoom. And if you'd like to donate, to our building fund, you are also most welcome. So, just as uh, a small addition to the announcement is that the registration link will be made available today evening. All right, so that rounds out the announcement for today. And with that, we will proceed with the morning puja before we begin our service. Let us start with the preliminary 
preliminary homage to the Buddha. Namo tasa bhagavato harato samma sambuddhasa Namo tasa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Namo tasa bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa. We will now do the five offerings to the Buddha. Let us take part in this offering, which allows us to express our gratitude to the Buddha and serves as a symbol to help us to remember the teachings. So, brothers and sisters, please join me wholeheartedly and let us read the verses together. Offering of light. Light symbolizes wisdom. May the light of Dhamma dispel the darkness of ignorance. Offering of incense. Incense symbolizes the fragrance of pure moral conduct. This reminds us to cultivate good conduct. Offering of water. Water symbolizes purity, clarity, and calmness. It reminds us to practice the Buddha's teachings to cleanse one's mind which is full of desires, ill will and delusion to attain the state of purity. Offering of Fruits Fruits symbolize the ultimate fruit of enlightenment, which is our goal. They also remind us that all actions will have their effects. Offering of flowers. Flowers symbolize impermanence. The freshness, fragrance, and beauty of flowers are impermanent. This reminds us that we should all live in the present. Remembering thus, we should reduce our craving and attachment. Let us now pay respect to the Triple Gem. Arahang Sama Sang Buddha Bhagawa Buddhang Bhagawantang Abhiwa Demi Swakato Bhagawata Dhamo Dhammang Namasami Supatipano Bhagavato Sawaka Sango Sangang Namami Let us now chant the verses for taking the three refuges. Buddhang saranang gachami, Dhammang saranang gachami, Sangang saranang gachami, Dutiyang pi buddhang saranang gachami, Dutiyang pi dhammang saranang gachami, 
ดุติยังปีสังกังสารนังกัจามิตาติยังปีบุตดังสารนังกัจามิตาติยังปีดัมมังสารนังกัจามิตาติยังปีสังกังสารนังกัจามิ Let us now chant the five precepts. Panati pata veramani sika padang samadhiyami adinada na veramani sika padang samadhiyami kame sumicha chara. เวรามานิสิกาปดังสมาดิยามิมุสาวาดาเวรามานิสิกาปดังสมาดิยามิสุราเมรายามาจัปมาดตาณาเวรามานิสิกาปดังสมาดิยามิ Let us recollect the sublime qualities of the Buddha. Iti piso bhagava arahang sama sambudo vijacara na sampano sugato lokavidu anutaro puri sada masarati. สัตตาเดวามานุสานังปุตโตบาเกวัติ Let us recollect the sublime qualities of the Dhamma. สวากาโตบาเกวัตตาดามุสันดิติโกอาคาลิโกเอหิปะสิโกโอปนัยโกปัจจตังเวดิตาบุวิญญูหิติ Let us recollect the sublime qualities of the Sangha. สุปฏิปันโนบาเกวโตสาวะกัสังโกอุจุปฏิปันโนบาเกวโตสาวะกัสังโกยาญาปฏิปันโนบาเกวโตสาวะกัสังโกสามิจิปฏิปันโนบาเกวโตสาวะกัสังโกยาดีดังชาตาริปุริสายุกานิอัตตาปุริสัพุกัลลาเอสัพบาเกวโตสาวะกัสังโกอาหุเนโยปาหุเนโยดาคิเนโยอันจัลิกาลานิโยอานุตารังปุญญาเกตังโลกัสสิสาดุสาดุสา All right. Our next segment of the program will be the short meditation led by Dr. Ng. Uh, before I hand to Dr. Ng, allow me to introduce Dr. Ng to all of us. So, Dr. Ng was born in a Buddhist family. She obtained her medical degree in Singapore in 1979, and subsequently the FRCS specialization in A and E Edinburgh in the year of 1987, uh, and also the Home Care USA in the year of 2002. She also Holds the honors degree of the Bachelor of Arts from the Buddhist and Pali University of Sri Lanka. She was the lecturer at the Mangala Vihara on the early Buddhist history from the year of 2001 to 2019 to the diploma students. She also teaches meditation at the Buddhist societies and a certified mindfulness teacher. 
So with that, I will hand over to Dr. Ng to lead us in the short meditation session. Because after serving, you can lie down. Okay. Oh, you take the pen. Okay. okay, good morning. So today I'm going to give a talk on the consciousness and aggregate. But I would like also to introduce to you 10 minutes of uh, meditation. And the meditation uh, that I'm going to introduce is to take the three refuges in your meditation and the five precepts. So I think without much ado, we will just start. So you make yourself comfortable. Cross your legs, put your spine erect. Put your mindfulness in front of you. And as you take the refuge, you embrace each sentence. After that, there is a pause and you experience whatever is said for the moment. Okay. I shall do it in English. For the first time, I take refuge in the Buddha. For the first time, I take refuge in the Dharma. For the first time, I take refuge in the Sangha. For the second time, I take refuge in the Buddha. For the second time, I take refuge in the Dharma. For the second time, I take refuge in the Sangha. For the third time, I take refuge in the Buddha. For the third time, I take refuge in the Dharma.
For the third time, I take refuge in the Sangha. Now we do the five precepts. I abstain from killing. Abstain from stealing. I abstain from sexual misconduct. I abstain from false speech. I abstain from harsh speech. Abstain from malicious speech. That is speech with ill will. I abstain from divisive speech, dividing people. I abstain from taking intoxicants, alcohol, smoking, Drugs, excessive use of handphone, computers, etc., etc., that leads rise to confusion and heedlessness and addiction. I abstain from intoxicants. So this is your 10 minutes of meditation. You then ground yourself, feel the bum on the seat, feel the entire body. Then we proceed with our mind to listen to the talk on consciousness and aggregate.
So what is to be conscious? Conscious is to be aware, to know. So when you wake up in the morning, you become conscious that you are awake. Right? So this conscious is to know, to be aware. Now, I use this as an aggregate because in the suttas, it can be uh, six aggregates, it can be fifth aggregate. So, I will want to explain it that consciousness is just an aggregate. Okay, so in this, so we will refer to the suttas to, so we have the uh, Datu, Vibhanga, Sutta, MN140. So in the Datu, Vibhanga, Sutta, this Sutta is the Sutta of the exposition of the elements. So the elements are the four elements, earth, water, heat, air, and that is the form elements. Then we have the formless elements, the space and the consciousness. So you can see then this in this Datu Vibhanga Sutta, it becomes the sixth aggregate, the sixth component. So it's talking about Datu, that means elements. So he said that we are of the earth, like our bones. And this earth is the same as the earth outside. It's no different. And we have the water component, and we have the heat component, and we have the air component. And this makes up a mass. So we call it body mass index. We occupy a space. And then with this material, it makes it living with the consciousness. So that's why it's the sixth element here. Can you understand in that way? It is just a component. And here the Buddha wants to emphasize on the elements. So here we all, each individual, we have our own body mass index, right? So we are, you are just a mass, a body mass index. So you tell anybody the mass index, they will know whether you are large, medium, small, or tiny. So you are but just your body mass index. And this body mass index occupy a space, correct? Your mass occupy a space. And this mass becomes alive only with your consciousness. So this is the sixth element. All right, thank you. Cannot, cannot, cannot see it. So now we go to the other fifth aggregate. The fifth aggregate that the Buddha usually talk about, the fifth aggregate. Is it better? So in, so in the suttas uh, that you can read, is Kanda Samyutta, the causes uh, on the five aggregates, on the khandas. So in Kanda Samyutta, go and read the Kanda Suttas. It will tell you the series of consciousness as part of the five aggregates. So what is it, the five aggregates? It will be your body, the feelings, This is not new to you, all right? Perception, mental formation, and consciousness. This one is more material. This one is more mental. Right. So if you want to talk about aggregate, if we combine the two, then we have the 7, 8, 9 aggregate. So it just depends on how you use it. But this is what we are make up of, an aggregate and a component. Just like you make a cake, you need some flour that's a solid, 
Then you have some water and the uh, egg, there's also water. Then you, you know, whisk it around with the uh, air and closing it, and then you put it to heat. So you have all these elements and voila, you have a cake. So you occupy a mess. So it can be a very small muffin mess or whatever. But what drives it is that somebody must bake it. There's a consciousness that must bake it. Right. So these five aggregates, it tells you that in the Kanda Sutta that this is what we are made of, the body and the mind. And in the another particular sutta, M and 43, on the greater discourse on questions and answers. Okay. In this particular sutta, it tells that the three of them, these four of them, they are conjoined, not disjoined. When it happens, it happens together. And how it functions, it functions is that consciousness is the light. When you wake up in the morning, it's that light, you wake up. Right? The sunrise, you wake up. You wake up, you are awake. So this consciousness is what makes you know that feeling is feeling. Perception is perception. Mental formation is mental formation. And body as body. Without consciousness, you do not know your feelings. If you are anesthetized, a general anesthesia, you won't know. Okay? And if you have a regional anesthesia, an epidural, Maybe half your body, you wouldn't know. So people can cut whatever to remove for the surgery. So it has to be the consciousness telling, making it conscious, making the body conscious, making you know what's your feeling, your perception and your volitions. So it's just, you can see it very clearly. So this sutta tells this property, conjoined, not disjoined. Okay. And then to further emphasize what just now was said, then you look at another sutta, SN 22.3. This sutta was given to a lay person. And it is mainly says that consciousness roam the body. Make it aware of your body. Whether you feel your size or whatever, or your hairstyle or your dressing, knows your body. It's the home of your feelings. Okay? Only when there is consciousness, then you know your feelings. Know your perception and the mental formation. So this is, this tells you consciousness roams in these homes. You have several homes. Okay. Then we say in another sutta, this is to build up your understanding of consciousness. Then, Diet, right here. In this diet, this, so this is Samyutta, this Kanda, okay? This one will be the sixth sense base. Diet. The diet, he says, consciousness is dependent, okay, on the base and the object. So, sixth sense base means three things, three parts of it. It means the sense base, the sense object, and the sense 
consciousness. Otherwise, it has no meaning. This sixth sense base, this is the sixth sense base, this is the internal, this is the external. And it says that the consciousness is dependent on this sense base and this sense object. So if you have the eye consciousness, the eye consciousness arises only with the eye is functional. If your eye is blind, if your occipital part of your brain or the part of the brain that is, you know, receive the, you know, there's a component, it's a nerve tract for the eye, and if that is non-functional, then eye consciousness cannot arise. It depends on the eye, and there must be an eye object. An eye object is like anything your eye contact, the flowers, the board, this is your eye object. So it's a sight, right? So eye consciousness only arises if the eye and the, that means the eye and the object is there, right? Yeah? So this part you all can understand, right? So similarly, yeah, for the others, for your ears, for your nose, for your tongue, what else? For your body, and then for your mind. So these five faculties, the six. Now, here we note uh, the Buddha talked about six sense base, and there's only six sense consciousness. So we have the mind base, And then we have the mind object. Then we have the mind consciousness. Okay, so far? So the mind consciousness arises only when there is a mind object. And then you have the mind base. We have this rupa mind base, so we have this ordinary human mind base. Okay, and this mind space uh, is what we are working on. There are other mind bases, and what are the other mind bases? That means you have the base of jhana one, base of jhana two, base of jhana three, four. These are the elevated rupa jhana bases. Okay, so there is the rupa. Jhana, one, two, three, four. And the arupa, without the body, but still you have the mind consciousness, and this you have the five, six, seven, eight. So this is the space, consciousness, nothingness, and neither perception nor non-perception. Okay. Now, what is mind object? So, in the Satipatthana Sutta, the Buddha very uh, clearly classify the mind objects. And these mind objects, he says, is the five hindrances that means there is lust. You are conscious of your lust, okay? Of your ill will. This is a mind object. Ill will, and then you have doubt, restlessness, and worry. And then you have sloth and torpor. These are mind objects. Then we have the five aggregates. Five aggregates. But this five aggregates is of clinging. 
The aggregate arises and ceases, but this mind object is the mind object of clinging to the five aggregates. Then we have the sixth sense base and the seven factors of enlightenment and the four noble truths. So all this, so your mind is like, you know, it's like a screen. So it's like a board, an empty board. And then there is an object in it. And this is how the mind objects grows. In this 12 DO, we know that ignorance we have give rise to volition, to consciousness, to mind body, to six sense base, to contact, to feelings, to craving, to clinging, to becoming, to birth, aging, disease, death, sadness, agitation, depression, despair. Now we go back to here. This is how the consciousness, if you engaged, engaged uh, with the mind objects, when you engaged with lust, then it will establish itself. The consciousness will establish itself. And then it will grow and expand. So that's why when you focus on a mind object, on lust, if it is addiction, it is addiction, nah, then it will go there. If it is a tendency, it will go there because volition is intent. Intent is craving. So, as long as you have intentions, you are engaged with it, with the mind objects, then it will grow only and there will be more lust, more ill will, more doubt more restlessness and, and sleepiness. So this is the mind object that grows if you engaged with it. So you can see this is how mind, consciousness, mind base and mind objects. They come into contact when they all three meet together when all three meet together, when these three components meet together, you have contact. Okay. So in this diet, uh, he explains uh, that there are these five sense base, five sense uh, consciousness depending. They depend on this to arise. Depend on these two diet. These two diet to arise. If this two diet is not there, it doesn't arise. So now I want to emphasize that uh, you all can see this component part. Now you must see the mind part. So the mind consciousness arise and cease on the contact. Okay, yeah. So we will then see this 12 DO as well as the three characteristics of existence. In the diet, it says uh, this contact is tottering and changing all the time. The contact is changing all the time. And each contact, uh, that means each contact changes. And how it changes, you can see if, let's say, you talk about I, if you sit in the train and you just sit there and you look at the view outside, the eye object just moves right. You can't catch it. Impossible to catch. The eye object changes. The eye object changes. And, and every time you see, you have to use your eye consciousness to touch it 
and then it's off. So the eye, you know, with the blinking of your eye, your eye base change, your eye object change, your eye contact change, the eye consciousness changes also. You think that there is the eye object or the eye is permanent, it's not. The eye contact is changing and tottering all the time. So let's say this is something very, uh, uh, something that you all experience. Now let's say you scan your eye. You scan uh, the objects with your eye. If you look at this word here, okay, so this particular eye consciousness knows, perceive this to be fifth, correct? Are you conscious? <laughs> no response, so I'm not too certain. Okay, so you see, your eye consciousness has to have a functional eye and an object. Then this eye consciousness arises and sees here. Now if you feel change to another object, it has to arise and cease here. So the eye consciousness arise and cease. Right. So you have the color changes. The perceive it is black, it is red. So the perception is different. Right. So if this is talking about eye, a fast moving object, a slow object, or in the five senses, you see, now you notice the hearing. What I have said is gone. The sound is gone. The eye consciousness has ceased, and then the ear consciousness arises. But because we move so fast, we can multitask so well. That's why this is like continuous, but it has to arise and cease, arise and cease. If for the person who is deaf, will not be able to appreciate the sound, but will be able to see the sight. Will be able to see people you no know, showing signs for the deaf. Right. So this is how the eye, the sense-based consciousness, arise and cease. So it is no different from mind consciousness arising and ceasing. So the mind consciousness, like for example, we take a mind object. So we all chanted initially. So it's a verb, it's a verbal thing. Then you meditate. So it's different forms. Right, huh? So you can see that mind is still mind. And the object is the sixth sense space. Because now you are meditating and refuging in your mind. Right? You are taking that words by words in your mind. So when you have a thought and you have a sustained thought on the three refuges, it naturally leads you to have a pleasant abiding, a calm abiding. And it's not you don't have to depend on the chanting. You can depend on yourself, your mind directing the contact with the three refuges. So this is how you engage with the positive to establish as a base so that the seven factors of enlightenment, of mindfulness, investigation, energy, tranquility, concentration, and equanimity can be engaged with and grow to develop fully. We don't want to develop the negatives. We want to develop the positive so that we can see the Four Noble Truths clearly. If you have tranquility, then you will have concentration. With concentration, then you can see clearly to have 
the true knowledge and liberation. If you don't concentrate, you won't be able to get your studies or your work done. But you must fully concentrate. You fully concentrate on whatever you are doing uh, with mindfulness, with investigation, with energy. The body will go into a rapture state. The mind will be happy as long as the is calm and there is equanimity and concentration. So I would like you to see how your mind works. So you want to engage with the positive and you want to abandon the negative. So that's what the Buddha means, avoid evil, do good, purify your mind. Purify your mind of mind objects. Right? Because all these changes, the mind-based change, the mind consciousness depends on them to change. Right? It is dependent. So it is but a tool which arise and cease. In all the Kanda Suttas, in all the Kanda Samyutta, the has always emphasized the five aggregates arise and cease. There is never a word that the consciousness is forever. So there is this four noble truth. The four noble truth is to see impermanence that all these aggregates, all these six sense base arise and cease, arise and cease. So this contact the diet says is tottering and changing. It cannot uh, stay. It's changing all the time. If you see it for yourself, it's changing all the time. And then you then this is what the Buddha says to Bahia. So we say the so three characteristics of existence to Bahia. And Bahia is Udana 110. And he tells Bahia, this very old man who thinks he was enlightened, but his Deva friend tells him, hey, you are not. You better go and see Gautama the Buddha. And there he went. When he met Gautama the Buddha, the Buddha was having his arms round. And he says that this is not the time to ask for a teaching. But Bahia was desperate. He says, please give me a brief teaching. And this is what the Buddha say on his arms round. That in the sin, just the sin, in the sin, just the sin. The contact, just the contact. In the hurt, what's the hurt? In the cognized, just the cognized. So that means in the contact, just see it come and go, come and go. Arise and cease, arise and cease. There will be neither here nor there and nothing in between. And so he did that. So this is cut off. If this is cut off, then there is no craving. So with just this brief teaching, just this brief teaching, Bahia understood. And it says uh, also in this Majima Nigaya 43, it says that wisdom and consciousness is conjoined. Conjoined also. Wisdom and consciousness is conjoined. He says uh, wisdom has to be developed. Consciousness has to be understood. He says as long as you know, then your consciousness is internalized. 
So the wisdom is yours. So wisdom and consciousness is conjoined, not disjoined. So for him, Bahia, his wisdom and consciousness was conjoined. So when he listened to what was said by the Buddha, in the scene, just the scene, in the hearing, the hearing, just hearing only, nothing beyond that, arise and cease, arise and cease. So it's like twinkle, twinkle, little stars, sense space, sense object, and they sense consciousness. He comes and goes, comes and goes. There's nothing there. If there's nothing there, it is impermanent. There's nothing to hang on to anything. There is nothing, no self. So the important thing about impermanence is that there is nothing. Where is it? There's nothing. So impermanence means there is no I, no soul, no entity. Okay, so that's what I mean by impermanence. It has nothing, it's void of it. So consciousness arise and, arise and cease. The mind consciousness arise and cease. If the, if the five aggregates are allowed to arise and cease, then it is just it. But because there is still delight and lust, because there is still delight and lust, if there is still ignorance and there is still a lust, then consciousness will arise. It is natural way. It is depending on conditions. So as long as there is ignorance, you will not be out of samsara. And there's, as long as there is lust, there will be consciousness arise. Because this is how it works. Because you have the intention, your craving. Your craving will move your consciousness to a new becoming. So only when this is off, then there would not be any bad and sad. This craving here and this craving is similar, but it's the driving force. So this is how it is said in the scene, just the scene. Now, I also want to say that this I consciousness and each individual consciousness has their own domain. I consciousness does not overlap. I consciousness does not appreciate the year. Okay? So each individual I consciousness, year consciousness has its own domain. But they resort to the mind. The mind tells the sixth sense base and it, the mind itself. So it directs its mind. So it's important to be your own CEO, to direct your mind properly. Avoid evil, do good, purify your mind. So this is, this is uh, consciousness, sort of, sort of a simple explanation. To, to say, to say uh, that it is arises and ceases. And if anybody tells you that consciousness or mind is forever, then you have to refer to the teachings of the Buddha. And, the, and to refer to your own experience of this whether it can be true or not. But why do people cling on to this? Because cling on to these five aggregates as wanting it to last forever. It is also this part here, you can see. It has to be penetrated. 
itself is telling itself, this is telling itself that the mind bases change. And that this mind bases, this formless, each one is said to be higher than the other. Space, after leaving the five faculties, then it can go into space. After surmounting the space, then you can go into the base of infinite consciousness. It must be very delightful, very peaceful. But even here, it tells you, you can surmount consciousness. And it says consciousness is nothingness. It goes, you penetrate, is nothing. And when you penetrate nothingness, then you see neither perception nor non-perception. And beyond that will be cessation of perception and feeling. Consciousness, vital formations, and the heat is only present. But the cessation of perception and feelings have gone. So the Buddha has always said, arise and cease, arise and cease. That the form is but form. So we change our body mass index to our lives, right? So it's like foam. Feelings is like raindrop, like a bubble. Have you seen raindrops on the floor? You can see them just splash and off it goes, splash and off it goes. You make a ripple and then it goes off. And then perception is a mirage. You think that it is something, huh? but it may be nothing, no? but it's actually nothing, it's a mirage. You see a rope and you think it's a snake and you frighten yourself, right? So many times sir, you may see something and thought it is something, but then it turned out to be otherwise. Some people think that at 2019 they can go for a holiday, 2020, but then you see perception, and then now you see better not go anywhere. Better to go inside, not to go outside. Okay, so you see perception is a mirage. And mental formations are like the plantain trunk, like empty. But you form it like the banana trunk. You know, you cut the banana tree, it's empty, but a lot of sheaths or banana leaves. So we form, we create. A magician, the magician consciousness, because he makes something out of nothing. He makes body, feeling, perception, mental formations. So he's a magician, by like pulling a rabbit out of the head from nothing. So that's why consciousness, you say, is like a magician. So I want to emphasize to you that it's arise and cease. Arise and cease. Consciousness arise and cease. And that you have to see it clearly for yourself. Not others telling you, but the teachings you have to read, the suttas by yourself, and then, you know, examine it. And then know it for yourself. So when you know it for yourself, what others talk is just others' talk. So there's also others who talk that there is seventh consciousness and eighth consciousness, the storehouse of consciousness. You have hear it, heard it before. But in the Buddha's original teaching, there is only six consciousness, just the mind consciousness. Whatever that is state to be storehouse, etc., these are just uh, entity that is later developed by later schools. But the original, just the six, are sense consciousness, just the mind consciousness only. Okay, so to say it arises and ceases, this is very important to know. Because arise and ceasing is the fundamental 
of the Four Noble Truths. Because you have the Four Noble Truths, uh, that there is suffering, there's an origin of suffering, then there is a cessation of suffering, and then there is a path. Correct? So you have these five aggregates. The five aggregates of clinging is suffering. Okay? Five aggregates. Uh, so there is an origin. For the body, it will be food. For the feeling, perception, and mental formation, it's contact. For the mind, consciousness, uh, it will be the mind body. As long as you have a mind body, as long as you are a human being, as long as you are being in samsara, you will have a mind and body. Gross or subtle. So this mind body, because you have a mind body, like we say here, you have the six elements, you have the consciousness. So this consciousness is because you are in samsara. You have to appreciate what is going on. So you have the consciousness. If you still have ignorance and still have craving, then this consciousness will arise. So this conscious, so as long as there is craving, uh, then craving will be engaged. And if you do not have any more craving, no more lust, then it's disengaged. Okay, so then there will be no consciousness that will arise. For the next, when the mind body ceases, when this mind body dies, then you don't, if you do not have any more volition or ignorance, then it does not have rebirth. So it is, this is how it works. And then these five aggregates, uh, these, these five aggregates arise and cease. And then we believe very much that there is these five aggregates and why we suffer because we feel this, we believe these five aggregates as self. We think that these five, person, uh, five aggregates is our personality. These five aggregates uh, as our personality, as a self. We believe that these five aggregates as the self, as a self. And all this self as the five aggregates. This self, this five aggregates is a self. And all these five aggregates in self, as and in. So it's integrated. So you believe that five aggregates as self, self as five aggregates. Then this five aggregates is in the self, and that this self is in the five aggregates. So these are reinforced. So then you have this personality. And this personality means there's an I, a me, a mind. This belongs to me. And when this personality seems so consolidated, then you suffer. Because when the consciousness sees any changes, it's agitated. And when it's agitated, it's restless. So then you are far from peace. Okay. Then we talk about something that is applicable to the consciousness also. Now in the Majima Nigaya, the last part, the fifth division, is about the sixth sense base. Sixth sense base. And the suttas there, MN 143 to 152, is all about the sixth sense base inclusive of the consciousness. But of 143, Majima 143, 
uh, is on the advice to Ananda Pindika. So we have Ananda Pindika. He, he was the one who donated Jetavana, right? And he supported the Buddha and the Sangha. On his dying day, he was in pain. And he asked for someone to go pay respects to the Buddha that say that he is gravely sick, just to honor the Buddha. Then he asked this someone, go to Sariputta, pay respect to Sariputta, and then ask Sariputta to come and see him. This is very relevant to us, right? We will be at the, our deathbed also, correct? And then with all this COVID, any time is the right time. Okay, any time is the right time. Don't fear it because it's just arise and cease. So what did Ananda Pintika tell uh, Sariputta? Sariputta asked him, how are you feeling? And he says, I'm feeling really bad. My head is like being split by somebody, you know, with a sharp knife. It's so painful. And that it's like somebody tie a band. It's so tight. Tight and painful. And, the, and he says his tummy is like being, you know, cut open like that. So painful, the tummy pain. And then he says, I feel so hot. Like two person bring me over to the charcoal grill and grilling me like that. So you can imagine his head is painful, his chest is hot, and that his tummy is so painful. Then Sariputta says to him, let your consciousness not be dependent on the eye, on the sense base. Okay? Not be dependent on the eye. Not be consciousness, you don't go, don't depend on the eye, don't depend on the ear, don't depend on the nose. Let your consciousness not depend on your tongue, your body, or your mind. So he says, let your consciousness not be dependent on these six sense bases internally. Then he says, let your consciousness be not dependent on the eye object, on the sight, on the smell, on the sound, on the taste of the touch, okay, and anything that you cognized. So your consciousness not to be dependent on the sense base, neither the sense object. Neither the consciousness. Let your consciousness not be dependent on the eye consciousness, the ear consciousness, the mind consciousness. Then it says, do not be dependent on the contact that arises from all these six. Do not be dependent on, let your consciousness be dependent on the feelings. So it says, do not have this. Because if you depend on this, you will have craving, right? So he says, do not depend. Let your consciousness not be dependent on the sixth sense base. Don't be dependent on your consciousness. Be not dependent on the contact or the feelings. Then he says, don't depend on the body, the elements, the earth, the air, the water, the heat, the space or the consciousness. So the consciousness not be dependent on the body and not dependent on the five aggregates. And not be dependent on this, on all these spaces. Your consciousness don't go there. And that it's not dependent on this world and the next world and not dependent on what is seen or heard or cognized or thought about. He says, let go. So after what he had heard, Ananda Pindika cried. And Sariputta asked him, why you cry? 
Is your pain getting worse? He said, no. I've never heard his tears or tears of joy. I said, I've never heard of such a Dharma talk. For all my years with the Buddha and the Sangha, I have not heard this kind of talk. Then Sariputta says, we only give this talk to the bhikkhus, to the Sangha. And Ananda Pintika says that this can be made available to lay people with little dust. Because otherwise, without hearing this, they will be wasted away. So on that same day, Ananda Pindika passed on. And he took rebirth into Sita heaven. And he returned to pay respect to the Buddha as a very young deva from Tusita, singing the praises of Sariputta. But we, in this particular sutta, we can see, we can see uh, that consciousness is how we direct. Do not go there. Do not be dependent on all this. Not dependent on all this because they are all impermanent. They are of no value. There's no substance in them all. So when you abandon it, then there will be lasting peace. Okay. So you all can go and read the suttas. And all these suttas in the aggregates, the kanda, samyutta, the Salaya Tana Suttas it is uh, very comprehensive. Is there any question? Yeah, maybe any question first. I open to the audience in the Dhamma Hall before we go online. If you have, you can raise your question and I'll come to you with a mic. Oh, yeah. BADD is birth, aging, disease, death. SADD is sad, agitation, depression, despair. So we are coming back to this bad and sad. You want? <laughs> So you have to abandon it. Okay. Oh yes, another, another. Uh. So the five arrogates. So we, we know that these five arrogates you know, create the Illusion uh, give us the false fake news uh, that there is an I and they belong to us. Right. So we have another acronym. for the aggregates. And we must consider the aggregates uh, as pigs like that. But no uh, discriminating. Uh. But then it's non-halal uh, if we all discriminate against. Okay. Uh. So what is pigs? The five aggregates uh, in the past and in the present and in the future arise and cease. So, the past aggregates of clinging are in the past. We project the past to the present. So, we cling to the past and we leave it out in the present. 
and we may project it into the future. So that's why you have these tendencies. So how to actually cut off those tendencies is that you have always to live in the present. If we allow the past to come into the present, then we are actually living in the past. So in order to, to remain in the present, you have to make an effort to stay in the present and not in the past. Because the five aggregates of clinging are of the past. So your screen that you have, the contact you have, must always be in the present. Like this is the breath, a new breath, a new mind screen, a new mind fear. Don't go back to the past. So you can decling. So you let go of the past, you stay in the present. In the present, it's also tottering and changing. So you don't go to the past and you don't go to the future also. It's also changing. So stay in the present. The present, you can see it for what it is. So when the time comes, you have trained yourself to be in the present. So when you die, then you experience the joy of dying. Right, huh? You see the breath and and oh like that. Ah. Okay, yeah? and not be fearful. And then it is that if there's the contact, you may have the feeling. The feeling terminating with the dying body, oh that's the feeling of in the that's the way it is for the dying body. And that's the way that it is for the feeling for the life ending. And when you see this feeling and perception that this is it, it is life ending, life force ending, this is uh, the death of the body and the death of the life force, then it ends and ends there. So that the flame, uh, the light, uh, doesn't go and descend on any base any base anymore. So it is that way you stay in the present practice is very important. You see for what it is. Every breath arise and cease, arise and cease, arise and cease. So you are very clear when the time comes, you contacting it, you also be very clear about the feeling arising and ceasing. Perceiving, rising, and ceasing. You do not create any more mental formations. The consciousness arises and ceases as the end. So then it cool right there. So this is past, present, and future. If the past, the aggregates are changing, the present, the aggregates are changing, then the future the aggregates are also changing. Why be seduced by them? Isn't it enough? So then you don't cling too much. You don't launch out too much. You stay in the present, content with the present. So it says internal external. Internal sense base, right, your eye, your nose, etc. External sense base also arise and cease, arise and cease. Far and near, here with us or far away in UK is the same. Far and near aggregates behave in this similar way, arise and cease. So if it's gross, if it's a big elephant, or it is a very subtle virus, it's also arise and cease, arise and cease. 
if you are very gross or you are very subtle, if you are very big or you are very thin, it's also the aggregate arise and cease. It is superior or inferior, it's also arise and cease. Superior as in those who can go to the jhanas, the high jhanas, and then they will be spending a long time there. When that period is over, the aeons is over, it also ceases. So, superior or inferior, if it's in the lowest realm of samsara, in the hells, also ceases. Just like Moggallana was in hell for aeons, uh, but that duration also ceases after he has done his time, after he has killed his parents. And the volition, the volition is the volition by another, but the act was done by himself. So the volition, the wife says, I don't take care of your aged blind parents, they are too much of a handful. So when they go round and round and round and brainwashed him, then one fine day, okay, he's going to stop this speech, uh, continuous sort of um, tape recorder or what. Uh, so he stop. So he did it. But when he did it, he suffered in the hell for aeons. And even in that lifetime as the one of the chief companion, chief bhikkhu, chief disciple of the Buddha, his death, he was chopped up for that deed that he had done. But his mind was liberated, so the body itself is something that he, is something that was part of his effect of the heinous deed that he had done. So his mind was liberated and then he pulled himself together and paid respect to the Buddha before he passed into his final Nibbana. Right? So you can see superior or inferior, all aggregates, whoever, whatever, they arise and cease. They are conditioned things. And conditioned things so is called dependent on conditions. There is no self there. Is impermanent. The property of impermanent is that there is nothing in it. That's why it's impermanent. That's the characteristic of being impermanent. So there is no soul, no substance. It's empty of self. So that's what it means. The five aggregates are empty. And if they are empty, there's no need to cling. So he says, this is something we don't want to hold on to. Do we want to hold on to the pig? Pigs. Is it? So we don't want to hold on to this. So we have this, the consciousness as an aggregate. And this aggregate is just part of this mind-body conditioned thing and it arises and ceases according to the nature of existence and it is how it works the 12 dependent origination shows how it works what is the driving forces to bad and sad that is all part of the Four Noble Truths. It gives you the idea of a personality, but you see the gratification of this, the danger of this, then you can escape from this. So this is uh, the talk on consciousness and aggregate. Thank you, Dr. Ng. There are a number of questions from online. <laughs> Okay. There are lots of questions. Uh, first, uh, can you clarify the uh, other acronyms of the SOCP and the diet that you use? Huh? What do you say? I can't hear. The acronym. Ah, uh, which one? 
as OCP. Oh, oh, suffering, suffering, four noble truth suffering, origin, cessation, and path. I thought, uh, and the diet. Oh, diet. Diet means two. Two, diet. Okay, diet means two. Depends on two things. Okay, I didn't. Uh, okay, two. Uh, diet means two. It depends on two things the sense base and the sense object. That's why it's called a diet. It depends on two things. Just So all this consciousness depends on two things. Okay. What other? Okay. <laughs> now there are long questions. Okay. Uh, dear Dr. Ng, if we have Vitaka and Vichara mm. sustain attention on an object, how does contact work? We have the volition to focus, example, say on a small object. Is it a series of contact on the same object or just a single contact that is sustained over time? All oh, right. So, uh, you have to investigate for yourself. Okay, yeah? First of all, the, uh, and then you will know it for yourself. But just to say uh, that uh, Vitaka Vichara. So it says in Vitaka Vichara that means we have thought and sustained thought. This is part of the one pointedness and the unification of the mind. So we are into the mind, not into the body. Okay, yeah? So we are in this, in this mind object. Thought is a mind object. Agree? Right. So we have a thought and we sustain that thought so, what is that thought and how to sustain that thought? So, you can be Buddha, Buddha, Buddha. So, this is a thought and sustained thought. If you even you can experiment and say thought, 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 thought. You can even use the word thought, thought. Sustain thought. And then you see how the mind works. So you have to investigate for yourself. So you to be enlightened, he asks you to investigate. So you must have mindfulness. You must investigate. You must have the energy. The effects of that is that you will have rapture, tranquility, concentration, and equanimity. So this Vitaka Vichara, because you are focused on this, then you will develop equanimity. So your, you would know whether your mind is concentrated or not, and whether your mind has equanimity or not. So you just apply a uh, Vitaka, a thought, any thought, Buddha. And I think there is somebody, uh, a scientist uh, who says, you just say one, 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 one. You will also have pleasure. You just use one word only. Okay, so then this is what people have said. But in the Buddhist context, in order to give it the uh, a power. So you see you have five faculties, you have confidence in the Buddha. So when you take the three refuges, you go to your quiet state very fast. You go to your tranquility, concentration. Do you just now? So if you 
have this, so you can take the three refuges because that is your thought and sustained thought. So we talk it in a bit of a spiritual sense, using the word Buddha or using the three refuges, or we say the five precepts, but then we absorb it and internalize it for ourselves so that we will also practice it because you have told your mind already. Hey, you have to abstain. You do anything, uh, you have, the mind will say, hey, you took the precepts. Stay clear of doing this. This is personal to you already. So the walk, Dharma is Pachatam Vedi Tabu Vinu Hiti for the individual practitioner. Nobody can walk your path yourself. People may help you physically and encourage you mentally, but eventually you are the one who walk the path out of samsara. Nobody yeah, can walk that path because we die ourselves. We came ourselves, we go ourselves. Right here. Yeah. So we must not be dependent on anybody, anything. You must be self sa Come and go. Okay, self sa like a hero. So here we say Vitaka Vichara. It can be a mundane object. It can be a spiritual object. Even in study as students, uh, I think student uh, is the best time of life, I think. But then when you study, uh, if you are concentrated, it's so enjoyable, right? I don't know why people say so stressed out with studies. It's just the results that's a problem. But you are given that time to study, do nothing but study, read a book, hold a book, read. So you're just concentrating. What is this specialist telling you? Can I enjoy as much as that person who write the book? Do you enjoy your student days? You know, it's just reading and enjoying it. So that is concentration. This is vitaka vichara. You enjoy your study. You concentrate on your study. You enjoy. And you also enjoy the results. I mean, if you can concentrate. But if you stress yourself so much, then the mind is not an enjoyable mind. The mind is not open. The mind becomes stressed. It's constricted. It's, not, it's all constricted down. So you must learn to enjoy. You must go and find out what is it that this person enjoys and can write volumes on it. So it's an individual uh, person and you get the inspiration. So you read his bio, his, oh, Wikipedia or what. Nowadays it's censored already, I think. Uh, a, bit, a lot of <laughs> the wiki is censored. But then you will enjoy your studies. So you must choose the thing that you enjoy. So your work you also must enjoy. Whatever you do, you must enjoy. Then your life will be pleasant abiding. Things you don't enjoy, you see how you can enjoy. It's all your attitude, right? So, Vitaka Vichara. Thank you, Dr. Ng. There's a very long question on Anapanasati, so I shall try to read it okay. carefully. Sometimes when I'm doing Anapanasati meditation, I realize my consciousness land on the words in, out, in, out, and I'm conscious of this talking. Then halfway, sometimes the mind becomes more conscious about the sensations of the breath on the skin. So one is a mind object consciousness, the talking of the in, out, in, out, and the other is body consciousness, the sensation of the breath. Even for the sensation, the consciousness of the sensation of the breath is different. For example, the sensation of the in-breath is different from out-breath. Can I know whether I should direct my consciousness to any particular object that is the in-out or the sensations? Or should I just let my consciousness land wherever it wants to? And uh, I realized that when the uh, sensation uh, in and out breath, there is also an uh, empty space in between. So should I switch to directing my consciousness to the sensation of the out breath 
Or should I just be aware of the cessation of the in-breath? So there are multiple questions on this uh, okay. Anapanasati. Right. So in the so the talking a bit more on the mindfulness of the body now, I think from the questions that the person asked is about the mindfulness of the first foundation and that is the body. So for this uh, mindfulness of the body, so she is or generally we are aware of the in breath and the out breath. So you experience the entire breath. So it is mindfulness of the breathing. So in the mindfulness of the breathing, this is the object that you are looking at. So the mind object is breathing. So then you see your breathing in and breathing out. So you are not actually uh, doing concentration. But this mindfulness will lead you to concentration. The mindfulness can lead you to concentration. So we all say about in if you uh, you follow the steps in the Anapanasati. It says breathe in. Uh, you know you are breathing in long. Breathe out long. You know you are breathing out long. First step. Second step is breathing in short. You know you are breathing out short or in short, right? And then you experience the entire, the step three is to experience the entire breathing process. And then the fourth step is to calm the breathing. Okay, breathe in, calm. Breathe out, calm. So at the end of it, uh, the body is calm. So you see, when you do these steps, uh, so you breathe in, you just, you know. So the know part is the conscious part. Breathing in, you know you are breathing in. So throughout that breathing in, you know you are breathing in. You are not thinking of something else. You are breathing in. You are looking at the breathing in process. Right? So you may feel the bodily touch of the breath, breathing in. And then you experience the breathing in, and then the gap, and then the breathing out. You are to be conscious of the breathing in process, which has the process of breathing in, and then there's a gap. The gap is there because it's a natural process. When we breathe in, when we sort of, like there's a hole, there's exchange of your oxygen and carbon dioxide. You, your oxygen goes into your blood, your carbon dioxide comes out, and then breathe out. So there is that gap. In that sense, the breathing in arises, ceases, and then you also experience the cessation of the in breath. So they stop already. Then after that, there is the arising of the out breath. And then the falling of the out breath and then the cessation. So in the breathing in, you experience the arising and the cessation of the breathing in and the breathing out. So you are conscious of all the processes. Generally, when you watch your mind watch the in-breath and the out-breath. You are actually like calming your mind already. Then you further use your thought to say, breathe in, calm. So your body goes into further tranquility. Right, so this is, so that if you do this, this is part of the training. So that when you need to tell us that, hey, calm down, man. Then you know how to sink into that state of that calmness. So this is uh, part of the training. So I hope I have answered here the question. Thank you, Dr. Ng. Uh, I think we have about 10 more questions here. So I'll start with a very short one, which you can just answer in one, one word. How many types of consciousness are there with us when we are living? So six. 
Okay, okay. Next Thank question. you. <laughs> Next, how do we strengthen our consciousness and I'll combine it with what happens to our consciousness when we pass on? Oh, how do we strengthen our consciousness is to be mindful. When you're mindful, you strength, you, actually consciousness is you direct your mind to something so you're conscious of it. So you have mindfulness. So consciousness uh, is not considered a strength, but it is a tool. How do you use this tool? So you have to use mindfulness to use this consciousness. You must know where this consciousness contact. So in the five powers, uh, you don't have consciousness. So it doesn't say as a power. So the power that the Buddha talked about, the five faculties are faith, energy, mindfulness, concentration, and wisdom. If you, ha you have these five faculties, you can strengthen each one as a power. So you call it strength. So you call it power. Because these five faculties can push you for realization. Just like faith, you know, you can, uh, the full confidence in the Buddha enlightenment, that the Dharma can lead you to end of suffering, and the examples of the thousands and countless of the Sangha members, the eight kinds of people, individuals. So these are the ones who have undergone the training by the Buddha and they have exited in various stages. So this is how this would help the being uh, to get out of samsara. So you call them strength. If you have your power is a strength, it can be developed. But he says consciousness, you just understand consciousness. It's not a power, it's just an aggregate. You have to pay attention and you have to pay wise attention. If you pay unwise attention, then when you engage with something unwholesome, the consciousness will just act as a tool. It will just grow, it will just set a base, you establish yourself, it grow and expand. So consciousness is a tool for you to use. It is a tool for you to use and to direct. So it's not really uh, the, uh, a power in that sense. So you want to pay attention. So you develop these seven factors of enlightenment. Just to say, using the right word, lah, strength and... Thank you, Dr. Ng. I'll combine these two questions again. Uh, how do you console someone who is about to die and is in pain? And another person asked, uh, Hi, Dr. Ng, my dad is currently in coma, but he is breathing with uh, and with the help from ventilation. His brain CT shows low activities. Family is considering what is next step as we are thought killing is wrong. What is your opinion? Okay, so the first question again. Uh, the first question is, the, uh, how do you console someone who is about to die and is in pain? So just now, this, uh, the first the question uh, you can read thoroughly in Majima Nigaya uh, 143. Okay, so that's the advice to Ananda Pindika, which we just went through. So it depends on the practitioner. That means on the person, you cannot fit this sutta to him because you have to understand the individual person, the person who is dying. Only when you understand the person, what his likes and dislikes, then you can say something that opens up his mind. And once his mind is open, then he can receive. If he's very stressed and in pain, he may not be able to uh, 
understand. So it's good to put this person in a, a nice environment, like nature. You know, nature where you can feel the wind, see the trees. Nature is very healing. So once the person is uh, put in, in another place, you know, the old place is in pain, then you move this person to a place, uh, the environment that is very healing. So this environment, uh, it natural healing effect. The trees, the earth, the wind, or even the sea, it has this soothing effect. It's like the wind blowing, you know, like caressing the person. You know, the person who have enjoyed being in nature before, they enjoy the breeze. So the mind then shifts from the pain because the contact is with the body. But then when there's contact with the external objects of pleasure, then the mind can calm down. Then when the mind comes down, then he can go into, if he's a Buddhist or in a whatever practitioner, spiritual practitioner, then because the breeze and the breathing in huh, seems to be like simultaneous, so it becomes enjoyable. So when they go to breathe in, they enjoy the air of breathing in because the whole breeze is like breathing in and then breathing out, breathing in and breathing out. If he can catch this in and out, and you can stay on this in and out. So this contact of in and out is pleasurable. And that he can strengthen this in and out with whatever spiritual alignment he has. If he likes Budo, he can say Budo. And it's on the air. And it's on an enjoyment. But if his inclination is Guan Im, then Guan Im. So that he enjoys it because the deity gives him strength. So it strengthens his mind. So when he able to see that focusing his mind on his breath that is air it's not hot like the earth that his mind now not contacting the earth or the heat or any part of the elements but of the air element so the air element is very airy fairy so it's very light Pain is usually very hard. So in that way, if he can see in his mind the lightness of breathing, because breathing will be with the person uh, till his last breath. So if he can go on that, then his need, uh, you know, that he, he, he now feels that he's, he can master something. So he can just has relief from the pain. Because it will, it, this is definite. When you do Anapanasati, eventually you stick to it, eh? but you must bring the person to the object and that he enjoys it. He must be able to be the competent cook, to know in your mind what to choose, what to choose, and you stay with that. You must cook a dish for yourself that is delicious, that you like, that you enjoy. So in the mind object, he must be able to see that this gives him peace and joy, just breathing in and out. Then he can direct his mind. He knows how to do it. So this is one way. The other ventilator patient Wait, can we, uh, another related question is, may I know where to anchor our, anchor our, anchor, I think, our consciousness on the deathbed to avoid focusing on the six senses? Oh, 
Okay. Also on that space. Okay, let's st st talk about the second question first. Uh, the ventilator. Okay. So, uh, like, the person is on a ventilator and the person is uh, drowsy. In coma. In coma. So, nowadays, uh, science has said that as long as the person is living and appears comatose, but the activity of the mind may still be there. Low activity. So the ECG uh, have some changes to say that there is low activity. But low activity is not no activity. Like low crime is no, not no crime, right? <laughs> so low activity means there is still activity. So apparently they say hearing uh, is there. Right? Hearing consciousness, you can still hear. So you must be, you will be able to talk to the person. And you talk to the person uh, in a caring way. In a caring way, uh, in the sense, you know, must know that person. And you must be very conscious and don't talk uh, as if this person uh, is not conscious of what you are saying. People who are in coma can hear, can understand, but cannot open their eyes or talk. They cannot respond, but they are still there. So you must respect the person who is lying there. You must give the person the respect and don't think that he cannot hear and say things uh, that may hurt him. So that's not what we want. We want to make sure that his journey is peaceful. So there is a, it depends on the person again. But in the sutta, there is Mahanama. I don't know what is the number, but it's Mahanama. So Mahanama asked the Buddha, how can a lay Buddhist talk to another lay Buddhist on his deathbed. So I will presume that the person is a lay Buddhist practitioner. So if you talk to a lay Buddhist practitioner who understands the Four Noble Truths, the uh, three characteristics of existence, 12 DO, as a concept even, if you just talk to the person, then you will say that uh, in that line, uh, he says, very directly, the, the Buddha will say, are you attached to your relatives, to your family? If he still said yes, sir, if the person is still said yes, don't be attached. You are going to die anyway. Why you be attached? This is straightforward, right? This is a fact. You are going to die. Anyway, do not be attached to your family. Right, yeah? So this is... Or if, if he's attached to his bed, uh, things, uh, you must say, don't be attached to those things. Uh, you're going to die anyway. Have you left those things already? Have you abandoned? Then you say, yes. Okay. Then he says, do not be attached to your relatives. You're about to die anyway your spouse, your children, to whoever, don't be attached. They are, you are to die anyway. So he tells them not to be attached to whatever things or relationships. Then after that, he has let go because things and relationships are the things that people are attached to, cling to, right? Then he says, what is better? Is hell better or the uh, animal realm better? What say you? Hell better or animal? Better choose. <laughs> Neither, huh? Neither, but animal is better. Then animal or ghost? Better. Ghost better. Ghost or human better? Human better. Human better or the Tavatimsa better? Tavatimsa better. Tavatimsa better or Yama better? Yama better. Yama or Tusita better? to sitter better. Then you go to Brahma. Then after that, the Brahma, he says, 
But this, so you see, as you go, the person also go up to the heavens, you know, bring the person up to the heavens. And then they say, but the Brahma world is also impermanent. No need to go to the Brahma world. Then you just let go of all the worlds. So this is, this is just generally Mahanama was the Buddha and Buddha says to let go. All are impermanent. But for the person who is comatose, uh, he can hear. Then you say, don't worry about your property. Okay? Don't worry about your house. I'll take care of it. Don't worry about your, this child. Don't worry about this person. Okay, uh, we all take care of it. Uh. It will be all right. Uh, so you don't want to uh, say anything. Just, you know, just say, you know, don't worry about these things. If you don't want to give any promises, just say, don't worry about these things. Because if you say, I will take care of him, you have to take care of whoever <laughs> you are saying. Uh. So you say, don't worry about this thing. He will be all right, you know. So this is a thing so that you will just allay his fears. Then you have, then reinforce you have been a good person. Then think, tell him all the positive things, you know, all the positive things. You don't want to add a negative thing. You don't want to put in the pink elephant. The pink elephant, because when you say a pink elephant, the person will imagine a pink elephant. If you say anything negative or the person mind object become negative. So you want to have, you want to paint whatever or in a very positive light. So this is how you say, don't worry about all this. So the worries are swept aside. Don't worry about your material things. Don't worry about relationship. Just think of all the good things you have done. Take refuge in the Buddha, Dharma and Sangha. And even, you no, know, this, and then uh, this is uh, important, you know, that this will lead to the higher world, having the refuge in the Buddha, Dharma and the Sangha. So always talk to the person. Uh. What's the last question you... Had? It's not the last question. <laughs> but uh, it's the, the, the thing uh, yeah. you asked just I, uh, May I know where to anchor our consciousness on the deathbed to avoid focusing on the six senses. So the consciousness, if you don't depend on the six senses, then you have the consciousness uh, not dependent. Uh, you have no last. Do you have any last? So you, do, you have not attached to it, then the consciousness is free. So like just now we say, uh, you just know that this, this is what is happening. So in his description, uh, in the description, I think in the, in the description, I think even with this one, you will be able to see. He says, uh, when the, you just watch in a detached mode, in a detached mode, uh, the feeling that ends with life, the feeling that ends with the uh, body that dying. Life force and the uh, uh, body, you know, dying. Uh, so you just observe this. You in a very detached mode. You 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 don't say I must uh, be this way. Uh, so you must learn to be in a detached mode. Oh, so this is how you die uh, like that. So this is the breath, right? So the breath ends ends. You don't have to like. Uh, you don't have to struggle. Where must I put? By then, you know, that if you say, where must I put, uh, it's like very stressful. Eh? Don't you think, say, where must I put? By that time, uh, you have no doubt of where you, can, where you will put your mind on. If you have stayed in the present, you know that the present arises and ceases, then you will be able to see the breath arise and cease. And the feelings and the perception that is the breath that rise and cease, and the feelings that arise and cease. Then the consciousness at the end of it just dies, then it dies off that way. So you can stay with your breathing in and out. Thank you, Dr. Ng. Another question is how do we be uh, how to be happy on a daily basis and to pull oneself up once we are lost? Okay. 
So uh, when you are lost, uh, you take refuge in the Buddha, Dharma and the Sangha. Right. And then if you strengthen yourself in the training, so once you direct your mind to the refuges and the conduct that you should have, then you'll be happy. Then you do your whatever you are doing uh, mindfully. In the four foundations, you are mindful of your body, your posture, your activities, moment by moment, wise attention to it, to your feelings that are arising, to your mind and mind objects. So this, you are mindful. So when you are mindful, you are concentrating also. And then you make an effort not to go to the unwholesome and make an effort to grow the wholesome. So you will be happy. Thank you, Dr. Ng. A few more questions. How can one in this materialistic world let go of one's ego successfully? Thank you. Let go of ego successfully. I still have an ego. So I, uh, one is the conceit. Okay, yeah. So conceit uh, is to compare oneself as better than another or equal to another or uh, lower than another. So this is the ego or in the Buddhist term is conceit. So conceit, we all say that it is of the personality, right? I have this name, I have this fame, I have this gain, I have this pleasurable objects. So when you have name, fame, gain and pleasure, your ego may grow more and more. So the Buddha said, may fame not come to me, where all the people come trooping and making a lot of noise in, his, in the forest. He says, may fame don't come to me, because fame brings along with them all these noisy people. So now, name, fame, gain, and has, a, has an effect on the ego. So when I say that the consciousness, uh, this consciousness of your name, so your name is very big, so your consciousness grows. So your fame is very big, then you grow. Then your ego will grow. Then, you know, gains, I have so much gains, you know, so your ego may grow further. So it may go in this way. So the ego may grow in this way. So in this, what you call material world. But all this is just material, right? So we all say the body are impermanent. It's just material only. You won't bring them along. So what, what is the problem is the mentality of ego and that there is no actual uh, ego, no actual sense of self because each individual person is unique. As that being go through samsara and process through samsara, that being has evolved depending on the conditions. So you, it's not comparable because the, each individual has their paramis, has his unique features. So it's not comparable. The lives that people go through is different. So there is no higher no lower, no same, because it's not the same. It's just different, uniquely different. And the process is just this 12DO processes. So it's, it's just like, you know, it's just changing, changing, changing. So because it's changing, uh, there's actually no conceit. But we will say we are better, we are whatever. But actually there is, everybody is unique in that sense. Unique, yeah? it's just it's in the passage of evolution. So it's not comparable, there's nothing to compare. So that's the, the ego part of it is that if you see it as dependent origination, then everybody has their gifts, so-called like 
karmic inclinations, other positive inclinations, etc. Thank you, Doctor. Mm, there are three more questions. I'm not sure whether you have I think time it's okay. to answer. If you all want to leave, also okay, but I can answer them. Okay, but the last question has three parts. Okay, first, first one. Uh, kindly explain again why wisdom and consciousness are conjoined. Oh, wisdom and consciousness is conjoined. Okay, so if you are, uh, so we talk about mundane wisdom and we talk about spiritual wisdom. So we all say consciousness is you know. You know something, huh? You know something. So no, so if you do not know, uh, let's say we are a child, we don't know the multiplication table. So we have to learn, right? After that is your consciousness already, the knowledge and that consciousness is conjoined already. Nobody would, if somebody tells you two times two is something else, you would not accept it because it's conjoined already. So this is called mundane knowledge. So once you learn it, you know it for yourself, then this is conjoined. You would not change your mind over it. So like fire will cause you pain. Yes. You might learn it the hard way, but that knowledge and consciousness is conjoined. So in that sense, if you see, so the Buddha always said vision. Vision, uh, you see. So you see for yourself, the wisdom uh, sees for itself that it is impermanent. That it is impermanent, there's non-self. When people tell you that there's a self, you won't accept it because the consciousness and the wisdom is already conjoined. To see, uh, you need to see with your consciousness. And then once you see, oh, Yes, this you saw for yourself. It is impermanent. There is no self. And that eyes and sees. And when people tell you that consciousness is forever or mind is forever, you know it's not true. You see it arise and cease for yourself. So the wisdom and consciousness is conjoined not disjoint. But wisdom is, has to be developed. You have to be trained. You have to, you have to train in this 37 factors of enlightenment. Then your consciousness will see. So you see, you have the vision, then you have the knowledge. Once you see, you have the knowledge, and this consciousness is used. So your wisdom is conjoined, not disjoined. Thank you, Doctor. How do we improve mindfulness? Mindfulness is that you have to train. You have to train yourself to be mindful, to be objective, to be detached, to see things uh, in a contemplative way, to see the big picture. So you are mindful of the small and the big. So this has to be trained. So in the four foundations. So you try to train moment to moment. Otherwise, you allocate those time, a time for it to do sitting. Because then you absorb what it's uh, mindfulness during a period. But you can do mindfulness of activities so you are mindful of whatever you are doing. So you can always ground yourself on your body, feelings, check your feelings, look at your mind and the mind objects. Thank you, Dr. Ng. Uh, sorry, there is actually two last questions. Uh, is there a, a state as described in the verses, 
in a single excellent night sutta in which one is moment by moment seeing each presently arisen state, but is so focused on the present that it is not about anicca which requires you to compare different moments. It's, is it just a feeling of letting go, letting go without remembering what one lets go? Thank you, Dr. Ng. So, uh, so we say that uh, you are living in the world and you are contacting the world. You are contacting your six sense bases. As you contact your six sense base, you know that this contact is just a rise and cease, that you don't need to hold on to any of these things. So in that sense, you are very mindful. You are that enchanted uh, with that. You just arise and cease. So you know that all things arise and cease. Thank you. Okay, last question in three uh, parts. Uh, thank you for the Dharma talk. I have three questions. In respect of the eye consciousness and five other consciousness, could you please confirm that respectively they need a working internal sense, an object, and most importantly, they must be contact. With these three components coming together, only then consciousness will arise. Contact, is it referring to the mind? Hence, consciousness arises and ceases from moment to moment. In essence, there is nothingness. Would appreciate if you would confirm my understanding. Okay. That is only the first question. There are two more from the same person. Okay, so uh, we say that this uh, contact, uh, the contact is from the sense base, that means the eye, as object outside, the eye object, and you must have these two before your eye consciousness arise. So these three coming together give you that contact. Right? Huh? It's not that the contact give you the consciousness, that's what he says. But it's actually these two arising and then the consciousness meet it, then the contact comes. Okay, so this is to clarify. Not the contact, then the consciousness arise, but it is the consciousness approaching these two. Then it is the consciousness arising. Okay, that's the question. And could you please share some tips as to catching the mind consciousness on a just-in-time basis? Okay. So when you are meditating, uh, your eyes are shut, right? Your eyes are shut. Uh. So when your attention uh, is focused on the breath, so you know your attention focused on the breath. So this is the mind that you're looking at, okay? So there's mind consciousness. So this mind consciousness arises and ceases. Okay, this is the breath. Then we talk about hearing. So you talk about hearing, so the mind consciousness directs, okay, directs. So the mind consciousness directs, go to the right ear. So you see the going to the right ear, the ear consciousness going to the right ear. But it's the mind which directs it. So you'll see it in actually, it seems your, it's closer, so you can see that the mind consciousness directs to the right ear. If you direct to the left ear, it directs. So the mind consciousness directs the volition. The volition directs the consciousness to go to either the right ear or the left ear. So you can see the mind consciousness in that way. But if you see it often, then if you see often, so you pay attention. When you are paying attention, that is the mind consciousness. When you pay attention, to the mind objects. So you see, whatever in your mind that you are looking at is a mind object. So most things are, are mind objects. So when your attention goes to that mind object, that is mind consciousness. 
So we don't. So we use the words. Uh, so anything. So like for example, looking at the consciousness itself, the consciousness is immeasurable. You know? Just like the base that this six are, uh, they call it immeasurable. So if it's not confined to the body, it's it's like immeasurable. And when something is immeasurable, it's like an octopus. That means there's so many hands. Uh, it can look at itself. So consciousness can look at itself. So consciousness can look at the base of consciousness, and the consciousness can also look at itself. So you can see mind consciousness on the object. So when you you see mind consciousness on the object, just see because you are meditating, and mostly you are in your mind. And so, if you are looking at your mind, then it is a mind object. So, even if you are talking about taking three refuges, for example, we take the three refuges, you can also see your mind consciousness when you say "budo," then your attention. Then you can see how your mind consciousness strike your mind, and which part it strike. You strike where you go and check out yourself. So you will see. You only now you may be just concerned, uh, you know, Buddham, Saranam, Gachami. But you look at it, what you are doing. You can also see what you are doing, so you can see where I see your consciousness striking even because you have this thought, ma. So the thought is Buddham, ma. So you can actually do Buddho. Where is your Buddho? Where is that mind consciousness touching that Buddho? So it's an object. So you can take a simple object, just say Buddha. Then you see when you say Buddha, where the attention goes. Then you see your mind consciousness. See how it lands, how it dissipates, how it lands, and how it dissipates. So when it dissipates, like you feel good, dissipates because everything dissipates. It opens up. So this is how you see mind consciousness. Thank you, Doctor Ng. Last question: At the arupa jhana of neither feeling and perception, uh, does volition or thoughts still exist? Is it correct to say arupa jhana eight is not anicca vata sankara? Thank you. What is that? Anicca what? Anicca vata sankara. What is that? I don't know. Anicca vata. Vata. V a t a. Oh, okay. I only know anicca. I don't know about pata. The only pata I know is pata shoes, but I don't know what pata is that. Never mind. So okay. we talk about the ninth jhana. So I think the ninth jhana is spoken at the forty-four Majima Nikaya forty-four. So you want to read about the cessation of perception and feeling? You go and read Majima Nikaya forty-four. So when The cessation of perception and feelings. Ah,、uh, we all have witness in the YouTube, right? There's Tibetan monks. I think there's a. I don't know whether it's still on. There's a Tibetan monk that went into cessation of、uh, perception and feeling, and then the body was there in the、uh, for a long time, right? So you can see that it is still the body is still living, ah,、uh, because it's like our living flesh. There's this. Tone still there. So in that particular sutta, I think it's forty-four, if I remember correctly. Forty-four. The the if it's if it's not correct, I'll tell you all again. So if it's Majima Nikaya, so they said cessation of perception and feeling. This ninth jhana only develop when the mind is mature. You cannot force. It to go into cessation of perception and feeling. It has to be mature. All the others can be a concentration exercise, but the ninth jhana is a maturity of the mind, of the practitioner. So in that sense, they say that the volition, ah, the verbal formation ceases first. Then the body formation ceases. So that means no more breathing in and out. Okay, so a person don't talk, 
and then the body, there's no more breathe in and out. But the vital formation still stay. There's still heat. Then the mental formation also ceases. The mental formation uh, is, top, is actually perception and feeling. So I did not say this just now because I think it may be a bit confusing for you all. But I will say it now since it has been asked. So upon the contact, uh, there's these five aggregates that arise. So on the first contact of anything that you have never contacted before, so you have a feeling. So when you have a feeling, then you perceive. So the feeling and the perception, you feeling and perception is actually mental formation. Because you have to form an idea of your feeling. You have to form an idea of your perception. So feeling and perception is actually mental formation. Subsequently, we may pampacha, we may make a proliferation of our mental formations. But for the first, it is like that. The first, the mental formations comprises the feelings and the perceptions. So when it ends here, so when there's a succession of perception and feeling, the mental formations ends. So perception and feeling ends. So the body ends, feeling ends, perception ends, mental formation ends, you just have consciousness. So they say the consciousness is, the person, uh, is the faculty is clear. Clear, the, just consciousness. And there's vital formations. That means he's still living. There's still a bit of heat there, but he stopped breathing already. So this is cessation of perception and feelings. And once the person enters into the cessation of perception and feelings, he enters and then emerges. Uh, then after having seen that this cease, feeling and perceptions uh, cease, that we have our four foundations, we have our mind and body, but we are being pulled and pushed by our feelings, by our perceptions. But when these feelings and perceptions cease, then all their cravings and clinging, taints all cease. So after they enter into the ninth jhana, it says that they become arahants. They are, they are no longer have any taints. Because emerging from it, they enter and emerge and they see for themselves the truth of the cessation of perception and feelings. So there's no more uh, things left for this. So this is cessation of perception and feeling. So this is to explain that. What's the second part? Nah? <laughs> uh, something about the vata. Oh, anicca vata. What's that? I don't know how to answer. I don't know what's anicca vata. So we can skip it. Uh, Dr. What did he say? What's the last sentence? Uh, I think it's... Is it correct uh, to say Arupa Jhana 8, the 8th Arupa Jhana is not Anicca Vata Sankara? Anicca. Okay, uh, the 8th, anyway, huh, I will just take part and part of what is asked. Uh, I'm not certain what is the... But is uh, the 8th Jhana is not a Sankata, no? It's still Sankata. It's still Sankata. That means you volitionally goes into this eighth jhana. Right? You volitionally, I surmount my nothingness. I enter into neither perception nor non-perception. And this is volitionally based. So volitional is asang, so it's sankata. So it's not asankata. So it's not nibbana. So ninth, uh, eighth is not nibbana. Oh, so it is uh, I think he may actually mean asankata, right? I think it's the uh, 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 sankara. I think it's, I mean, it's around there. But I, uh, say, I would say that this is volitionally based. 
This is volitionally based and it's not Nibbana. But Dr. Ng, I thought after a certain jhana, it's not volitionally based. Oh, it's volitionally based. It's volition. So you read Anupada Sutta. Anupada Sutta will say that Sariputta goes, yeah, all are volitionally based. It may be very subtle, but there is still volitionally based. That you, he says uh, when he, he goes and he, uh, Jana one, he says there's certain thing that still can be surpassed. So after he attained it, he emerged from it and he go to the next one and that he can escape from this to go to another. After he has experienced entirely this, the five aggregates of it, uh, and then he goes on and on, he said it can be surpassed, it can be surpassed. And then he enters into each, attain into each, and that he says that it can be surpassed. So he surpassed and he went to the cessation of perception and feeling. Thank you uh, so much, Dr. Ng. Over to you. Uh. Okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Ng. Um, okay, with that then, it, we will end with the closing puja. Yeah? Hmm. We start with the dedication of merits first. All right, so uh, today we will have the sharing of merits to one of our uh, Buddhist uh, brother, Mr. Mulyawan Tambunun, Tambuun, who just passed away on the 4th of August uh, this week. Yeah. So may wherever he is reborn, he will enjoy peace, he will enjoy happiness, and always be close connected to the Dharma. With that, we will recite to invite all beings to participate in our acquired merits. Eta wata cha amhehi sambatang punya sampadang sabe dewa numodantu saba sampati sidia Eta wata cha amhehi Sambatang punya sambatang Sabe buta anumodantu Saba sampati sidia Eta wata cha amhehi Sambatang punya sampadang Sabe sata anumodantu Saba Sampati Siddhiya. We will now recollect all our past relatives and invite them in this dedication of merits. Idang me nyati nang ho tu sukita hon tu nyatayo. Idang me nyati nang ho tu sukita hon tu nyatayo. Idang me nyati nang ho tu sukita hon tu nyatayo. End of service dedication, let us recite together. I dedicate the merits which I have accumulated to the cultivation of my mind in order to bring happiness and benefits to all sentient beings. I dedicate the merits to my parents, children, spouse, relatives, friends, colleagues, and my adversaries, wishing them long life, happiness, good, good health, happiness, and prosperity. May we never part from the Triple Gem, and may we always walk the path towards enlightenment. Now, before the closing homage, I just would like to announce that on the 29th of August, the last Sunday of this month, we will have Ajahn Brahm to give the Dharma talk. So that talk will start in the afternoon at 3 p.m. With that, 
We will now do the closing homage to the Triple Gem. Arahang Sama Sambudo Bhagava Buddhang Bhagavantang Abhiwademi Swakato Bhagavata Dhammo Dhammang Namasami Supatipano Bhagavato Savaka Sango Sangang Namami Sadu Sadu Sadu